Hi, my name is Peter Goadsby. I'm a neurologist and I'm interested in visual snow uh, syndrome. I came to it in my clinical practice. I've been interested in it for more than a decade. And I'm trying to make a difference. My interest in visual snow, visual snow syndrome, commenced when I was working in London at the National Neurology Hospital and at the Children's Hospital. I saw patients who'd been sent to me with a diagnosis of migraine aura who clearly didn't have it, but had a visual disturbance all over their visual fields in everything they could see. And I thought, well, it's not aura. I, that was the only useful thing I could say, which is, I found a bit frustrating. My attention really got piqued when I was sitting in the Great Ormond Street Children's Hospital seeing a patient, six-year-old, who described the same thing. And when the penny dropped with that, that a six-year-old says the same thing as a 60-year-old, tells you there's a biology behind that. It told me that the six-year-old didn't get it from the internet, they didn't read it somewhere, they didn't, they didn't get told about it. It was genuine, because children are very honest about that. And from that point on, I thought, I really need to do something about this at some point. I started being interested in VSS visual snow syndrome when I saw patients in London, adults who had the problem, sent to me with migraine aura, who didn't have aura, they had something else. I, I really got piqued when I saw a six-year-old who had the problem. It clearly, there was clearly something biological going on. I didn't pick it up as quickly as I should. The next sort of phase for me, the second phase, was when I was in San Francisco and I was seeing patients sent to me with this, uh, that I'd seen with this problem. And I'd begun to get very unsatisfied with the best that I could say was you don't have anything I know anything about, which is hopeless really as a, as a physician. And we had the opportunity, we had some resource from, um, from a patient group and had a, a fellow who wanted to do the work. So we studied visual snow syndrome. We started to categorize it, classify it, and we started to study its biology by look at brain imaging. And the next phase is really about understanding that biology with more brain imaging, eventually measuring the electrical signals uh, in the brain. So I've, I think I've had a journey from frustration myself, which I think is a silly way of thinking about it because it's the patients who are frustrated, obviously, to really wanting to dig into it so we can understand it and get doctors to understand it's there and we need to do something about it. My research in VSS has taken two parts. The first part was to characterise the problem. When I first came to it, there was no definition. There was no accepted way of talking about it. There was actually no acceptance it even existed. The first time we put together a group and put together a group of patients and we tried to characterize the problem. When we first presented it, I was really advised by various people that I was crazy or the patients were crazy and I was wasting my time and we should just go home. It was a little frustrating because anyone who's ever spoken to someone with this problem understands it's, it's real. So first thing was to systematically define the problem or bootstrap that, get it from nothing, so to speak, so that we could all talk, a, have a definition, we could all talk a common language. I think that's ter been terribly important because all researchers are now using a common language. And the second phase really has been about understanding the brain structures that are involved. It's clearly a brain problem. It started with what's called functional imaging with a technique called deoxia, called uh, fluorodeoxyglucose, where you see where brain activity is. It's moved on to more advanced techniques with functional imaging, up to techniques now where we're trying to understand the neurochemicals that are involved. Because everyone who watches this wants a treatment. And you can't get a treatment until you, you can clarify the problem, classify it, define it, and you can understand where you're going. And when you understand where the targets are, then you can start to talk about treatment. And that's where we're headed. There are two ways to think about how many people are affected by this problem worldwide. There's how many have it, some have it I think in a relatively mild form, and then how many have it 
and it gives them some problem. So it's a, it's a condition with a range of effects. I think there's, the work would show you, population work that's being done, that the order of magnitude must be in the 100 million or so if you're looking, about, looking at it globally. I think that whatever we estimate, whatever I say will be wrong, it'd probably be an underestimate. And part of the problem is the degree to which people accommodate and don't even notice it. So I'm, I know I'm hedging a little bit, but it's an area where I don't think we finally fleshed it out, but it's certainly not trivial. Part of the issue in estimating the problem is that many people just get on with it. They've had it from birth. They don't almost say anything about it and they just work around it. And if they knew something could be done, things might be different. But because it's so under-recognised, so under-discussed, it's surprising sometimes what people will put up with.